Welcome to another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup. I'm Jean Deville, joined as always by my co-host Blaine Curcio. This week we discuss the recent activities of the CNSA. We talk about how yet another Earth observation constellation is sprouting up in China. We discuss also an interesting interview from the CEO of the launch company Landspace. But first, let's talk about this Chinese startup that's planning on commercializing geostationary relay satellites. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dongfang Hour. Please make sure your seatbelt is securely fastened. So one of the main problems that any Earth observation satellite operator faces is to have a sufficiently a dense network of ground stations, and this is to enable satellites to fly over these ground stations sufficient times to downlink all the data that they've acquired with their payloads, with their instruments, as well as receive commands from the ground. And on this topic, one issue that perhaps China faces more specifically is to really have a global network of ground stations. And I say specifically because while all other spacefaring nations face this problem, China perhaps has you know the specificity of having fewer overseas territories. And perhaps fewer allies as well around the world to be able to establish a very dense network of ground stations. Although, admittedly, China has done quite well so far. It has quite a few ground stations in foreign countries, such as Argentina, Chile, Namibia, Pakistan, and other countries. And it also deploys a network of tracking ships called Yuan Wang, so which are, act like ground stations at sea, notably for important launches. And finally, they also have a network of geostationary relay satellites called Tianlian, and basically these act like ground stations, but in space. So a lower Earth orbit satellite typically would send the data to these relay satellites in geostationary orbit, and then the relay satellites would send this information back to ground stations in China. So on paper, definitely China still has a very, a pretty solid network of ground stations and of systems to downlink data. But the new issue that commercial companies are facing, so the new wave of commercial Earth observation companies in China, is that they don't really have access to the resources that I just described. These resources are reserved for China's national space program, and this is probably because this network is already very busy coping with the fast-paced growth of Chinese national program Earth observation capabilities. Typically, the Gaofen, the Haiyang, the Yaogan, the Zhiyuan satellites, and also probably the Chinese space station. Because I just learned a couple of days ago that the Shuntian Space Telescope that will be sent into space in 2024, this space telescope alone will be offloading 50 terabytes of data to China every single day. So definitely a lot of work and a lot of strain for China's downlink and uplink、um, national network infrastructure. Now back to these commercial companies. How can they solve this problem? One way to solve it is to partner with TTNC companies, so companies that have a network of ground stations and that provide them as a service to satellite operators.、Um, and so there are Chinese TTNC providers, but these tend to be still quite small, although they're expanding rather fast. You also have foreign TTNC companies, which are definitely a solution. But there is a risk of if you know China's relations with the countries of origin of that company goes bad, well, that could affect also the relationship with the TTNC company. So there is no ideal solution really yet today. But we saw recently a new Chinese commercial company called Hualu Space, which has proposed a third solution, sort of to solve this problem, and this would be setting up a network of geostationary. Relay satellites, and there are several advantages to this solution. The first one, the most obvious one, is there would be no need to put any ground stations outside of China. A network of three or four geostationary satellites would be sufficient to cover that. And also, on paper, it looks perhaps more simple because you have three or four geostationary satellites that can cover all low Earth orbit satellites instead of having a very dense network of ground stations all around the world. And finally, another advantage that Hualu Space mentions is that a LEO satellite can communicate with the GEO satellite with laser interlinks rather than using radio waves, which is the technology that's used today for LEO satellites to communicate with ground stations. And so this enables faster data transfer speeds. So on paper, it looks very nice. There's of course the question of if Hualu Space will be able to pull off this project because it's definitely no small project. And I think the only other commercial company that has attempted this in the past was a San Francisco company called Odyssey, I believe. And those guys plan to set up a constellation of medium Earth 
Orbit relay satellites, but they went bankrupt in 2019 after their satellite demonstration failed. And so back to Hualu Space, quick background on the company. Hualu Space is a commercial spinoff of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. They were founded in October 2018, and their lead investor is a company called Cass Holdings, which is basically one of the main investment arms of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. And so being backed by the Chinese Academy of Sciences, this is definitely an advantage. I think at the very least, this means um, strong financial support. But perhaps even more importantly, this could mean that Hualu Space could tap into one of the many space projects that the Chinese Academy of Sciences is involved with. And just one example that comes to mind, this could be the case for CGSTL's Jilin-1 Earth Observation Constellation, which will, when it's completed, when it's fully deployed, have 60 satellites in orbit. And this is definitely you know, a fast-growing constellation, so definitely a potential customer for Hualu Space once their network is set up in space. Nevertheless, I think that it's still definitely a challenge sending a couple of geostationary satellites into orbit. I think that's at the minimum tens of millions of US dollars and potentially hundreds of millions of US dollars if we're looking at larger relay satellites such as um, you know, the Tianlian that uh, the National Program of China has sent into space. So um, this will be an interesting project to follow. And I also note that it's perhaps one of the projects in China, one of the few projects that has no equivalent so far, no commercial equivalent outside of China. So um, I think, yeah, that's uh, another point that makes this uh, project especially interesting. Yeah, Blaine, any any thoughts on Hualu Space before we move on to uh, Land Space? Uh, so yeah, just a couple of, uh, of side points. So that is a pretty mind-blowing number indeed. 50 terabytes of data per day coming from the Shunkan telescope. They're going to need a bigger boat to get some of that data back down to Earth. And then the other point, uh, interesting foreshadowing for later on in this episode, referring to the ground station in Argentina. We will get to that in just a little bit. That being said, first we're going to discuss an interview with the Land Space CEO, Roger Zhang Shangwu, which was shared on Twitter by the always insightful friend of the Dongfang Hour, the ace of Razgriz. So a couple of really interesting nuggets to come out of this interview with Roger Zhang. So first, the biggest question in everyone's mind, Zhang did confirm the launch of the Jiuquei 2 or the ZQ-2 rocket to occur in 2022. And this is something we have been waiting for for quite some time. Zhang also noted that the manufacturing capabilities for the ZQ-2 are already complete at the end of 2021. And when asked about the delay of the first launch of the ZQ-2, which was originally planned for 2020, Zhang noted that Landspace has been focusing primarily on building out the infrastructure for their rockets rather than focusing on any individual rocket, noting that in the rocket industry, it is much more important to have the infrastructure that you need to build a new rocket, especially when you're talking about a rocket using an unproven fuel and sort of new technologies than it is to build any single rocket. We also saw in the interview mentioned that there was an insider at Landspace who said that once all of the infrastructure and technology for the ZQ-2 is finally deployed and built, that they are pretty quickly thereafter going to move into batch manufacturing and regular launches. So definitely something to keep an eye on for 2022. During the interview, Zhang also gave a rare insight into the early days of land space. So the company was founded in 2015 with Zhang and two co-founders. And at the time, they had 13 million RMB, or just about 2 million US dollars. And of the 13 million, apparently 5 million, or about 800,000 US, came from Zhang and the two co-founders, with the other 8 million RMB coming from some angel investors. So you know, perhaps not quite three people in a garage starting to build land space, but hey, they might have actually been in his garage if garages were more common in China, but more probably it was in their flat. And what a long way Chinese space has come since then. So as Zhang noted during the interview, between 2015 and 2020, funding for Chinese commercial space companies went from about 700 million RMB, or just more than 100 million US dollars, to about 10 billion RMB in 2020, or 1.4-ish billion US dollars. And so indeed, financially speaking, the industry has come a very long way since 2015, which is perhaps even more impressive when considering we still seem to be in a pretty early stage for the commercial space sector. So another interesting dynamic during this interview was the comparison between land space and SpaceX. And this is sort of an inevitable comparison in the sense that most leading Chinese commercial launch companies are at some point or another considered the SpaceX of China in, uh, in the Chinese media. And during the interview, uh, this comparison seemed to make Zhang a little bit uncomfortable with the interviewer noting that he seemed a bit anxious about the issue. And so implicitly, I think there's a couple of reasons for this, but probably the biggest one is you know, implicitly a Chinese version of SpaceX, it's sort of, um, it implies that land space is simply copying SpaceX, 
which Zhang very clearly does not feel to be the case. And during the interview, he noted, you know, whether it's SpaceX or Blue Origin, everyone knows that the technical route is feasible. With enough money, we can definitely make it. But how much money is enough money and how long does it take us? Which is to say that, yes, land space is certainly doing the same thing as SpaceX or Blue Origin, which is to say building liquid powered launch vehicles. But they're doing it their own way, using their own technology. And they recognize that, you know, perhaps not anyone, but many different companies could do this given enough money and enough time. And we often see Western commentators noting that, you know, this Chinese company is copying SpaceX. And to the extent that there are Chinese commercial companies building rockets, um, that is true. But in the end, I would argue that just building a rocket, even one using a specific type of fuel, is not really copying. Just as Tesla building a car that's powered by electricity is not really copying the General Motors EV1, which is, of course, the first modern electric car. So that being said, this week, we also saw a new prospective customer for China's commercial launch companies, that being yet another small to medium sized constellation that has been announced. So, Jean, do you want to give us a bit of an update on what's going on over in Harbin or otherwise, if you have any other thoughts on, uh, on Zhang's interview, welcome that as well. Absolutely. So let's move on to this new constellation. This week, we saw the announcement of a new Earth observation constellation that goes by the name of Tiangong, and that would be composed of 36 satellites. And this announcement took place at a signing ceremony in the northeastern city of Harbin and saw the commercial manufacturer Zhuhai Satellite sign an agreement with the Tianjin Xingtong Zhouhang Science and Technology Corporation for this constellation. Now, this constellation will be used for natural resources monitoring, disaster prevention, and other fairly standard Earth observation applications. And the first satellite that's currently under development, and that was what the signing ceremony was about, will be sent into space next year. It will be sent into a 500 kilometer sun synchronous orbit and will have a hyperspectral payload with a resolution of roughly 10 meters. So as mentioned, it will launch next year and it will be followed by five other satellites also next year. And together, they will be referred to as the Yunnan-1 01-06 satellites, and this will represent the first segment of the constellation of 36 satellites, which compose Tiangong. So I think there's not much more information on this constellation, but just a few more general comments on it. I think this constellation is really an interesting example of how government and state-owned enterprises-led um, space infrastructure projects are increasingly involving commercial companies. And uh, typically I say this because the uh, so-called Tianjin Xingtang Zhouhan Corporation is actually the company that is managing the science and technology platform of the Geological Survey Department of the Ministry of Natural Resources. So definitely by definition, you know, quite state owned for sure. And I also say this was in the past, we were used to seeing government projects reach out to state owned space hardware providers. And so typically, you know, satellites like the Beto, like Galfin, like Haiyang, all of these would be manufactured by state owned satellite manufacturers, and they would be launched by state owned launch providers. So typically the Long March rockets. But there are signs that this may be shifting a bit. So definitely this contract for Zhuhai Satellite is one sign of that, but there are others. Typically, the CMSA published in January of this year a request for proposal for a small cargo spacecraft and that seemed open to commercial companies. And we also saw a couple of weeks ago CETC Institute 38 and the Beijing University of Posts and Telecommunications, so two state-owned players, reach out to the commercial company Space T for the manufacturing of the Tianxian and the Tianxuan constellations. And so that's definitely another example of that. And finally, I'd also mention that the Shiyan 11 uh, government technology verification satellite was launched on the X space Kwaijo 1A. So admittedly, you may or may not consider X space as a commercial spinoff, but the fact that it was not launched on the Long March rocket, that is also a sign of some of these things shifting. Now, admittedly, that's definitely not at you know, NASA level where space stations, lunar landers, cargo delivery, crewed space flight, and potentially deep space relay satellites in the future. These are being increasingly handled by, you know, commercial players in the US. We're definitely not in this situation in China, but it seems that we may be slowly shifting. So uh, definitely something that's, uh, that's very interesting to watch. Speaking of these um, large scale projects, Blaine, do you want to uh, tell us a little bit about the activity of um, the CNSA in recent days or weeks. Absolutely. And uh, holy cow, has it been a busy few weeks or so for the CNSA and most notably its uh, its director, Zhang Kezian, and particularly in the area of international cooperation. This week, Wednesday, China and Argentina met and discussed plans to strengthen bilateral ties with specific focus on science and technology development. 
So the meeting took place between Argentina's newish ambassador to China, Sabino Vaca Narvaja, and Zhang Kezian, the director of the CNSA. So the two countries agreed to promote negotiations on a 2021 to 2025 space cooperation plan, encompassing a variety of areas, including space science, deep space exploration, and Earth observation. I would point out that Argentina has become an important partner for China and its space ambitions in recent years across these different areas. So in space science and deep space exploration, we saw China recently build the Espacio Lejano Estación Station in Nuequen, Nuequen province of Argentina, as part of its deep space exploration network. And on the commercial side of things, we saw Satellite Herd, a Chinese commercial TT&C company, recently open a ground station in Argentina as well. And up to this point, I would also say that Argentina's space initiatives, uh, in this case, rather more commercial ones, have benefited from their cooperation with China. And so notably, we've seen the Argentinian Earth Observation Constellation Satellogic, which is, again, quite commercial, so rather separate from uh, you know this particular meeting. Um, but they've received funding from none other than Tencent, and they have more recently launched a handful of their satellites on a Long March rocket. So Definitely, we're starting to see this collaboration between China and Argentina in the space sector heat up. And again, I do think that it will probably benefit both sides and their respective national priorities. In what was indeed a very busy week for Zhang Kezian, the very next day, the CNSA met with the State Space Agency of Ukraine, or the SSAU, via some virtual talks. And the talks appeared to center on, yet again this time frame, a 2021 to 2025 program of China-Ukraine cooperation in space. And so just a little bit more information on China and Ukraine cooperation historically, we have seen cooperation in areas related to propulsion, among other things, with Ukraine being home to quite a lot of rocket science brain power coming from its days in the Soviet Union at working with their space program. And indeed, we've heard from sources inside of China that at least one Chinese commercial launch company has been in talks with the Ukrainians about collaboration and technology transfer in that sector. And these couple of meetings came about three weeks after a very similar meeting between Zhang Kejian and the Italian ambassador to China, Luca Ferrari, which took place back on the 12th of November in Beijing. So again, we're looking at three meetings inside about three and a bit weeks between China and Argentina, Ukraine, and Italy. And during the meeting with Italy, Zhang Kejian and Luca Ferrari discussed cooperation in the fields of space and nuclear, similar to the discussions with Argentina. So I think China clearly sees specific technologies, notably things like space, nuclear energy, and defense, as being highly strategic to these different countries and their national level priorities. And China sees itself as being in a position to play a sort of senior partner in collaboration projects with these countries and most likely other countries. And I think it seems like China is ready to collaborate with these countries, but I think it's also noteworthy that the collaboration, it seems to be in some ways on Chinese terms. And so... Uh, I will have my last mention of that specific time frame, but I don't think it's a coincidence that, you know, these uh, couple of meetings have talked about 2021 to 2025, which is the period of China's 14th five-year plan. So again, um, maybe not explicitly, but sort of implicitly getting these other countries to be on kind of a Chinese development schedule, if we could uh, refer to it as such. So, um, and that being said, I think that's about all from my side on that uh, on that story. So, Jean, anything else from uh, from your end? I, I wonder if the countries that you mentioned will have some role in the future in the ILRS, the International Lunar Research Station, which is the uh, Sino-Russian-led sort of lunar station project that is currently in its early stages. And speaking of which, just a quick plug for an infographic that we did recently at the Dongfang Hour, which compares the ILRS to the Artemis program. So do check that out on our website or on our Twitter if you're interested in that. Definitely. And um, if you're listening to the audio version of this, a thank you to uh, one of our reviewers who noted that the music in the background on the audio version of the podcast was not as enjoyable as it would be on the video version. So we have rectified that. And if you're listening to the audio, you can thank that one very kind reviewer. And this is also a nice reminder that if you like what you are listening to, please do leave us a review and or a rating on your podcast platform. It's probably going to help us find more viewers and listeners. And that's probably going to help us justify spending more time on the podcast. Uh, Jean, any, anything else really now from your side or are we, uh, we just about good for the week? I'm all good. Thanks. All right. Well, uh, just a very quick shout out then to our good friends at spacewatch.global and GoTigonauts, two great sources of space industry news. And um, yeah, I'm Blaine Curcio, joined as always by my co-host, Jean Deville. And this has been another episode of the Dongfang Hour China Space News Roundup for the week of the 29th of November to the 5th of December. And we will see you next week. Thank you for watching. Thank you for watching.